Well, hello boys and girls. This is Mr. Mark. This is our second video on thermodynamics. Remember that thermodynamics is the study of motion, momentum, forces, and energy of microscopic things, such as the atoms that make things up. In this video, we're going to concentrate primarily on the energy component of that. And so a good title for this lesson would be internal energy. Um, so recall from the last video that the kinetic model gives us a picture for how particles moving randomly with a distribution of speeds have energy. Also recall that anything that moves has kinetic energy equal to one half mv squared. And this applies to really small things as well, such as atoms. So individual molecules and atoms will exchange energies through collisions as they move around and bump into each other, but the sum of all their energies are going to stay constant. Energy's got to be conserved. And so in a sample, we can kind of take a big picture view and not worry so much about the little individual molecules, but just worry about sums and averages. And so that's what this lesson is about, sums and averages of energies within a sample of really small things. So here's our picture from last time. We've got a sample of a gas, and you know it's a gas because they're spread out. They're moving all directions at random. Let's suppose that this is at t equals zero seconds, and that if we took all the kinetic energy of all those little things, in other words, if we did one-half mv squared for all the molecules and add them up, we got something like three joules. If we took the gas sample a second later, the picture might be a little bit different. So different, or excuse me, individual atoms would have different velocities and in different directions, but we would still have the same number of atoms and they would still have a total energy of three joules. So I don't really need to worry specifically about the energy of this atom. So here it is over there. I just need to worry about the sum and the average. Those are the important quantities we're going to be concerned with. So the average kinetic energy can basically be found if we know the average velocity of all those little particles. Remember k equals one half mv squared and so the average kinetic energy would be proportional to the average velocity. So when you draw a horizontal bar over something in an equation like that it represents the average quantity. And that's kind of typical in science. So remember this graph from last time. If we graph the number of particles versus their speed the peak represents the most probable speed that we would see, but the average speed would be just a little bit to the right of that. That's because the graph is kind of skewed to the right. It's not perfectly symmetrical. And so if we had a graph like this, if we knew what the Boltzmann distribution looked like, we could figure out what the average velocity was, and therefore what the average kinetic energy is. Now in practice, this isn't really easy to do. We don't always have this distribution. It's something that has to be measured experimentally. So there's really a better way to get the averages, which again is the important thing that we want to know. And that way to do that is temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles that make up a substance. If somebody were to ask you how hot something is, you would probably go and measure the temperature in order to figure that out. You're measuring about how much energy there is. And so in terms of temperature, the average kinetic energy is given by the equation 3 halves K times T, where K is the energy in joules, T is the temperature in Kelvin, it's got to be Kelvin, we have to use the absolute temperature scale, and K is a constant of nature called the Boltzmann's constant, named after a guy named Ludwig Boltzmann. So you can get to that equation from this, 
starting with k equals one half mv squared. But it's really kind of complicated, and I don't feel like it'll be worth the time to go through it. So if you're interested in that derivation, it's in your textbook. You can probably find it online somewhere. We're just not going to take the time to go through it. So we can get to this, starting with what we just saw, k equals one half mv squared, where k and v are averages. Um, this is for ideal gases only. Remember, ideal gases don't exert forces on each other. So you can't use this to figure out the kinetic energy of liquid water, for example. We're going to see later on we have other methods of doing that, basically other equations that we would use. So again, K is called the Boltzmann's constant, and it's a number which basically characterizes the energy gained per degree Kelvin for an ideal gas. It's got a, uh, or typically it's symbolized with a subscript B, because K shows up quite a bit. And so I'm going to add a little subscript B in my equation to the K. And the Boltzmann's constant has a value of 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. And so when you multiply that by Kelvin, you get a um, energy in joules. Now that's a really, really small number, and it's a number that we've had to measure experimentally. There's no real way to um, determine that from just theory. So, simple example. Suppose you have a sample of an ideal gas that has a temperature of 200 K, and we want to know what is the average kinetic energy of the particles in that sample of gas. Well, that's where this equation is is um, handy. So it's one half. Boltzmann's constant is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. And then the temperature is 200 K. And that would give you a value of 4.14 times 10 to the negative 21 joules. Now that's the average energy per each particle. Not the sum, just the average. The sum would depend on how much stuff was actually there. So that's a really, really small number. But remember, atoms and molecules and things like that are very, very small particles. So it actually represents something going pretty fast, just with a very small mass. So here's the next question. How would you find the total kinetic energy? That tells us how much energy we could potentially get out of it to do things like work. So if we know what the average is, that's the per particle average, all we've got to do is multiply by the number of particles that we actually have. So suppose in this example, there are 6 times 10 to the 23rd particles, which is a reasonable number of particles. That number might look familiar to you. We want to know what's the total energy. Well, if we take the average energy, again, that's joules per particle, multiply it by the number of particles that we've got, that'll give us the total energy. So in this case, it's something like 2,500 joules, which is pretty reasonable for a medium-sized sample of gas. Um, ask yourself real quick, is 200 Kelvin a warm temperature or a cold temperature? It's actually very, very cold. It's about 100 degrees below freezing in the Celsius scale. Um, so that's a pretty reasonable energy to get. Now, usually we don't count the number of particles that we have. Um, for one, it's pretty much impossible to sit there and count the number of atoms. And for um, second, it's not a very convenient number to use. So remember in chemistry what you did. A more convenient way to count things was to use the measurement of the mole. Remember, the mole is just a counting number. It's not going to be as hard as all those dimensional analysis problems you may remember from chemistry. So please don't hurt yourself just because you see the mole pop up. Remember that all that a mole is is just a specific number of things. So one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. In this case, we'll say particles since that's what we're studying. That number is a special name. It's called Avogadro's number, named after an Italian feller named Avocado. Sorry, I mean Avogadro. That was a lame joke. 
And the symbol for Avogadro's number is N, as in number, with a subscript A for Avogadro. So instead of using this equation, which is the number of particles, we could use this equation, which will be in terms of number of moles. The letter R represents the Boltzmann's constant multiplied by Avogadro's number. That's its definition. Boltzmann's constant is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin, and Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to, the number, 10 to the 23rd particles per mole, hence the unit 1 over mole. And when you multiply those together, you actually get a relatively nice number of 8.31 joules per mole per degree Kelvin. That number may be familiar to you. Um, you may remember it from chemistry. It's referred to as the ideal gas constant. Now, if you're going back and forth between chemistry and physics, be careful with the value of R. In chemistry, you may use a couple of different values depending on the units you're given. Um, for instance, if you're measuring with liters versus milliliters, grams versus moles versus um, kilograms, you may use different units. But we're always going to use this value for R in physics. And the primary reason we're concerned about energy, we want it to be in terms of joules, not pressure and volume. We want it to be in terms of energy. So if you're going back and forth between chemistry and physics, do be careful about that. If we want to know the total energy in a sample, we take the kinetic energy and multiply it by the number of moles that we have. And so that's what the letter N in that equation represents. And so the 3 halves RT tells us the energy on average per particle, excuse me, per mole, not per particle, per mole, multiply by the number of moles to get the total. And so this brings us to the definition of internal energy. Internal energy is given the symbol capital U, and it's defined as the sum of all the energy possessed by the particles that make up a substance. Now this is a definition we're going to be coming back through throughout the entire year. So it's a really important definition. Keyword in there, sum and particles. So we're not worried about the kinetic energy of the whole object moving forward. We're worried about the kinetic energy of the things that make it up. We'll find throughout the year there's other kinds of energy that we need to learn about that are going to factor into that definition. For example, electrical potential energy. So, for an ideal gas, remember that they don't exert forces on each other, which means that they only have kinetic energy. They don't have any potential energy because there's no work done in um, attracting or repelling the molecules from each other. And so all we have to do to find the internal energy is find the kinetic energy. Remember, that's the equation 3 halves nRT. Um, remember, energy changes are what's really important. And so the change in internal energy can be given by 3 halves nR change in temperature. So that's going to be a very important relationship because when we want a gas to do work, like in our car engine, for example, this is going to tell us how much energy is available to do work. Now remember, this is for ideal gases only. This doesn't tell us how much energy is available in liquid water, for example, or ice. Um, but for gases, it works real nicely. Now the thing that we're um, ignoring here is gravity. Obviously things that are um, in a gravitational field would have gravitational potential energy, which we're kind of ignoring here. And the reason that's okay is because the kinetic energy of these little atoms is much, much larger than the potential energy. If you don't know, this symbol right here, uh, like two greater than signs stacked together, means much, much greater than. It's a pretty common symbol in science. So, again, the internal energy is the sum 
Of all the energies possessed by the particles that make up the substance, gases, we're only going to have kinetic energy, and we can find the kinetic energy just like we did previously. Now, a little bit of discussion on liquids and solids. Liquids and solids behave differently because their particles are held together by electric forces, which in chemistry you may have referred to as intramolecular forces. Really, they're just electric forces like we learned a little bit about last year, and we'll learn a lot more this year later on. Um, they're still a little bit free to move, so they have some kinetic energy, but because there's interactions between them, they also have potential energy. So for instance, a liquid might look something like this, where all of these atoms are kind of gathered towards the bottom, as in they don't fill up the volume of the space that they're given, and there are significant forces on them, which prevents them from moving in all different directions. Now they're still moving together, but they're kind of sort of held together. So you kind of think about swimming through a pool. You're kind of limited to the space you can move up and down in, but you can move kind of side to side. Very simple analogy. A solid, on the other hand, the particles are sort of locked into place by those electric forces. There's still a little bit of room for them to move. Basically, they wiggle or vibrate back and forth. Now, I'm not going to draw all of the arrows there. I'm just going to draw one set. But basically, those things can just kind of wiggle back and forth. So they have a little bit of kinetic energy, but not a whole lot. And so as you go from solid to liquid to gas, the particles have more kinetic energy, less potential energy, until you get to a gas where we assume they have no potential energy. Um, for all these things, the temperature is still a measure of the average kinetic energy. So that's not going to change. How we use that in an equation will change, however. So let's look at a simple example involving a gas. Suppose you had 12 moles of an ideal gas, which are warm from 150 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin. We want to know what's the change in internal energy of the gas. And so here's where our new delta U, remember U is internal energy, equals 3 halves in our delta T. So the 3 halves is there. N is the number of moles. R is the ideal gas constant, which has a value 8.31 joules per mole per Kelvin. And then delta T is the temperature change. So 400 Kelvin minus 150 Kelvin. And so crunching the numbers, do the change in temperature first. It's 250 Kelvin. K's cancel out. Moles cancel out. And so our unit is joules. And then when we evaluate that, we would get something like 3.7 times 10 to the fourth joules. So that's a pretty significant number of joules, because that's a pretty significant temperature change. And 12 moles is actually quite a lot of gas. And so we would expect you know, a reasonably large number. So that's the end of this video. In our next lesson, we'll be studying how that energy was transferred, which is going to be like the really big important part of this unit on thermodynamics. How does energy go from one substance to another? And can we use the energy transfer to do useful work? So next time, we're going to learn how a car engine works. Till then, ta-ta.